All right. Hey, let's go ahead and get it airborne. Today, we have a guest who is an international business consultant, a multiple Shingo Prize winning author. We'll talk about that. Speaker, trainer, leadership coach, and implementer in lean business delivery system. He has over 36 years of experience in materials and operations management and has saved his clients millions of dollars. More on that. Uh, this person on our show today is one of my mentors. We met about four or five years ago down in uh, Plano, Texas, during a little five-day session on the flow system. We had some pretty interesting conversations, and uh, I was able to get him to go to Whistler, Canada with me. Uh, it sounds a little weird, I know, but we went up there and engaged with uh, Gary Klein, Dave Snowden, and some brilliant people who understand complexity theory, business theory, uh, theory of constraints, and uh, uh, you, you name it, they were up there with us. So uh, it's our pleasure to have Charlie Protzman on the show today. Good morning, sir. How are you doing today? Doing great, Punch. It's uh, great to be here with you and Mark. It's really an honor. I think uh, you've been more my mentor uh, than anything else as far as all the learnings that I got from you during that, uh, that class. <clears throat> I, I, I appreciate that, Charlie. But the, the truth is, understanding the Toyota production system has been part of my journey as well, and uh, you and Nigel have helped uh, guide that. And I think there's an interesting connection in your family that we'll, we'll probably talk about in a moment. But can you help us understand something? What, what is a Shingo Prize winner? What, what does that mean? So the Shingo Prize is uh, offered by uh, a group out of, uh, out of um, University of U Utah, I believe. And um, it's the highest level award that an author can get in the lean uh, realm, if you will. So uh, it, it's a very selective process. Not everybody that applies wins. And uh, it was really an honor for me to win uh, those two awards from the Shingo Prize <clears throat> uh, group. And uh, the first award that I received was actually um, handed to me along with uh, Ritsuo Shingo, who was Shigeo Shingo's son. <clears throat> Very nice. And we'll talk about the Shingos here in a minute. And you, you also released a book recently called Lean Leadership Basics. Uh, and how, how well is that book doing right now? I think it came out in the last two years. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually been out for a year or so. And it's, um, I think it's actually one of the best books we've written to date. And um, we were actually honored to have Ritsuo Shingo yep. uh, write the foreword for us for that book. Yeah, and congratulations on that. I'm looking right at it right here. I have a copy signed by you, so so thank you very much for that. Next question. Why would a Shingo Prize winning author, a lean enthusiast, somebody who understands operational excellence and, and how to get teams and leaders to really deliver value to their customers, want to be on a show or have any interest in John Boyd's work on the OODA loop? Why, why would you want to be here? What's the connection for you? So... Ever since you introduced me to the OODA loop, my world has changed. Uh, the, the, a, a, as well as uh, Canavan. And uh, it just opened up a whole realm of, of new possibilities and new learning. So uh, I think the one thing I've learned in life is that uh, the more you learn, the more you still learn how much still has to be learned or there's still so much to be learned out there. So, uh, the, the OODA loop was very intriguing to me. And, uh, you know, we got into some very interesting discussions about that and PDC gay and, uh, our initial thoughts on PDCA versus the OODA loop. And since then they have, uh, uh, evolved, um, to, 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 to many degrees. Yeah, that, that's really helped me understand PD, PDSA and PDCA and, and learning more about your family's history, which kind of overlaps with John Boyd's journey. And, and I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't go back and look at who your grandfather is and maybe some possible connections through the timeline going back to post uh, or reconstruction in Japan to how the Toyota production system evolved, uh, when John Boyd started looking at that, and maybe where we are today with you and I having these conversations. Can you take us back uh, to 
Japan after the war and what was happening then and and how your family's connected to some of that uh, work? Sure. So it, it, it's kind of, it, it's actually a really interesting journey. Um, my grandfather was selected out of 26 potential candidates uh, to go to Japan to help during the occupation. Um, he arrived there on November 13th, um, and he was working with a gentleman named Homer Saracen. Uh, Saracen had gotten there in 1946, uh, just after the war ended, um, and had been working on repairing the communication systems in Japan. So, you know, back then everything had been bombed. So there was just destruction everywhere. And one of the first things MacArthur needed was the ability to, um, communicate to the people and to his troops. So uh, Saracen had spent a couple of years working on the infrastructure with a lot of the manufacturers trying to get things up and running. And keep in mind, this is in the days of vacuum tubes, um, if you will. So uh, there were a couple of guys there before my grandfather. And um, I don't know all the ins and outs of, of what happened there, but basically those uh, gentlemen left and my grandfather was brought in. And, uh, during that time, my grandfather went out and surveyed, uh, 70 Japanese companies. And as he was surveying the companies, the things that he was finding, um, was more about management than quality. And at the time, the person he was working for was a gentleman, um, named Combs. And, uh, Mr. Combs was, uh, basically very command and control, if you will, in that he told my grandfather he was just there to look at quality, and that was it. And every time my grandfather came back and said, I've looked at quality, but the problem isn't the quality, the problem is the management, because if we don't get the management right, the quality will never sustain. So they went, the reason he did so many surveys was because Combs kept sending him out to do more surveys. And basically told him he didn't want him to get involved in the management piece at all. So as things progressed, um, he ran his findings by, by uh, Homer Saracen. And uh, my grandfather was pushing for a training course that they deliver a training course to, the, to these uh, communications companies. And uh, Saracen agreed. And they presented it to uh, Combs, and Combs was uh, consistently fighting them. So the the reason turns out that in the end, they were really concerned that if they gave the Japanese this course or this class that they wanted to give them uh, in American management, that they would become too competitive uh, against the U.S. They, they didn't want to give them that leg up. So the decision actually went to MacArthur and uh, Saracen was given 20 minutes to speak. And uh, I I don't know if it was Combs that spoke to MacArthur or someone else, but they were given 20 minutes to speak. And uh, there's lots of articles on this, but basically Saracen said that he he had no idea how it went. He, he, He wasn't sure based on, MacArthur's expression because basically he had a poker face. So uh, as uh, Saracen was leaving the room, MacArthur said, go do it. Give him a course. So between the two of them, they uh, parked themselves in the Daiichi uh, building over there or headquarters, uh, which was for a SCAT and uh, built this uh, training course, this manual, I sent you a copy of it. And uh, they delivered it in two classes, one in Tokyo and one in Osaka. And uh, the course covered quality, um, but also covered American management. So uh, the course was designed as uh, for over, uh, was given over eight weeks uh, in 
four days a week and half day sessions. And then they were given homework each day to come back and bring back to the, to the class. Um, and the course was given to all the major communications companies at the time in Japan. So the course was given to the likes of uh, today, what we would know as uh, Sharp, Pioneer, Sony, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, um, you know, all the, the big names. And in fact, when they, when they surveyed Sony, um, which had a different name at the time, they were actually uh, building these electronics in with dirt floors, you know, in huts, because that's all they basically had available. So, uh, so it's kind of an interesting story. Um, after that, they needed somebody to um, continue on because uh, in 1950, the Korean War was starting. Uh, Saracen went with MacArthur uh, to Korea, and my grandfather came back home. Um, but they were asked by uh, the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, JUICY, uh, for someone to help keep uh, keep things going from the, the quality side. And um, they wanted to send Schuert, uh, but Schuert was sickly at the time. So they ended up recommending Deming. And that's how Deming got his start over there as far as the quality portion. Deming had been over there doing statistics work for MacArthur uh, with the census, uh, census that they held in Japan, um, but hadn't been doing anything down the, the quality front per se. So that's that's really what led to Deming, who got all the credit for this. The CCS was relatively unknown until uh, a gentleman named Ken Hopper uh, who was good friends with Drucker and a guy named um, Takio Kato uh, found out about the CCS. And then uh, that he basically brought everything with the CCS to light and wrote an article called A Lesson Learned and Forgotten that uh, was in Forbes. And Charlie, CCS uh, is, is the name of the program. Help me out again. What was the name of the program? So CCS stands for the Civil Communications Section. Okay, And that was one of the groups in the occupation that uh, MacArthur had set up. And it was made up of a vast number of people yeah. Um, yeah. that were there to reconstruct all the communication systems. Uh, the, what's, what's interesting about this, Mark, is the overlap between what John Boyd wrote when he was in uh, occupied Japan and how he was uh, upset about how military leadership was managing folks. And, and, and I think he tore down a, uh, was it a hanger back then? So, I mean, we're, we're going back to something that has a nice connection that many people don't know about these stories that people don't know about. And this, what Charlie just highlighted for us is uh, a, a different, I guess, an unknown view of the origins of how American management was brought into or American style management was brought into Japan or actually almost paused uh, in fear of the Japanese having a better capability in the future. So Charlie, we appreciate the story and we appreciate your, uh, your grandfather's work. Uh, or, uh, Charlie, would, would you speak a little more about the mutual learning that took place when they're, you know, they're surveying these companies and they're bringing in, uh, American statisticians, et cetera. Can you talk about sort of the give and take and the quid, quid pro quo and what they, what they found interesting and maybe what got fused together? So the there, there's a there's a lot to answer in that question. The 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 reason that the course became so important was that there was a purge in Japan after the war mm. of any leaders that were sympathetic with the emperor. So that left a void in many of the companies in their top one, two, or three levels. Uh, so you they were in a situation where they were faced with uh, leadership that all of a sudden lost, you know, the top level. And in many cases, didn't just didn't know how to proceed. 
So that kind of set the stage for this and also set, set the stage for very willing participants because they, they really wanted to learn. Um, there's a story about one, one company that they went into and I, I, I could get the name for you, but typically in the, the Japanese culture back then, you didn't, you would only share the results of a, a, an assessment like that or a survey like that with the president of the company. And this president actually had all of his uh, leadership team come in during the assessment and uh, ask them to speak candidly. So that, that was a very unusual type of situation back then. But the, the, um, the learnings went, went back and forth in the class, as I said, and my grandfather just loved the Japanese people and, and would do anything for the Japanese people. He actually had four trips after that, um, to follow up on, on those visits. He also supervised the laying of the underseas cable back in 1956 between, uh, the U S and Japan, um, as part of that. Wow. Fascinating background story. Charlie, we, yeah, the connection to, to Short and Deming, I'm, it is, it, I'm, I'm kind of interested in it, if there is any. So 1950s, the Korean War, uh, John Boyd's flying F-86s. Uh, many people attribute the OODA loop to that time of his life, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, he doesn't come up with the OODA loop until about 40 years later, uh, but he does reflect back on that time. So speaking about reflection, in the 1950s, uh, I believe... <laughs> That's when we see the the development of the is it the Schubert cycle and, and Deming's um, PDCA is that correct and, and, and is there any connection to uh, what your grandfather was doing in, in Japan at the time? So Schubert, I'm going to go back to my timeline here. Um, Schubert got his doctorate from Berkeley in 1917. And then in 1980, he joined Western Electric and he worked at the Hawthorne plant. Um, his first control chart came out May 16th, 1924. Um, and then uh, he um, moved to, uh, and that was while he was at Western Electric, then he moved to Bell Labs. Um, <clears throat> so his statistical work goes back goes back into the 1920s. Um, my grandfather joined Western Electric in 1922, moved to the Hawthorne plant uh, in 1926, and then moved to Baltimore in 1930. And in 1925, Deming uh, spent two summers in 25 and 26 interning at uh, Western Electric. And that's where he met Schuert. And then they developed a relationship after that where Deming visited Schuert uh, quite a bit at his uh, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey uh, home. Um, so that's that that was the connection between them. Um, another name you hear is Duran. Duran also worked for Western Electric. So uh, and also went over and taught to Japanese quality. And you don't hear a lot about him. Um, but he, he did a lot of work over there as well. As far as the PDCA, PDSA cycles go, that's a, that's a longer topic. Okay. So I can jump into that now if you want, or we can hit it later. Uh, well, I imagine it's going to come up. So this, to me, this is a very important component of Boyd's journey and understanding not just uh, TPS and lean, but uh, management. So, uh, and I think PDSA and PDCA have a lot of, uh, I hate to say confusion, but they're, they're, I think we need to just kind of set the record straight. So Charlie, please go ahead and, and help us out. So <clears throat> sure came up with what's known as the, the PDSA cycle and Deming elaborated on it. Um, and PDSA was more around the, the product development piece um, where th they would 
manufacture the product, inspect the product. They would have the, uh, they would send it to the customer, get feedback from the customer, and then work on improving the product after that. So PDSA was Plan, Do, Study, Act. So it was more along the lines of product development or Scrum, that type thing that you would see today. It 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 didn't really cross over into the manufacturing world per se as PDSA. The when my grandfather taught the class um, with Saracen, they went through um, what they called the scientific method and the six steps of the scientific method. And I don't have that at my fingertips. But um, basically, the six steps that they came up with are eventually what became known as PDCA or Plan Do Check Act. The for whatever reason, when the when the term PDCA came along, and I don't, I still don't know exactly who came up with the term, but it could have, from what I'm starting to get into now, it could have been Ishikawa um, or Duran, but I'm not sure which one of those. Um, but. Um, Deming started using that term over there um, as as being interchangeable with his PDSA, but he never really used PDSA over there. So for whatever reason, he went along with PDCA over there, and that's what created all the confusion. There's several papers out now, one uh, written by a guy named Moen, who has since passed away. Um, and the one that I sent you is the one that actually talks about that Deming uh, actually stated that he he didn't know PDCA. He didn't agree with PDCA. He didn't know where PDCA came from. Um, and that was in the 80s. And that it should be, you know, it should be PDSA or Plan to Study Act. So we believe that PDCA actually emanated from the CCS teachings in that course. And I have uh, a Japanese professor by the name of Toshio Gato who published a book. And he, he says as much in his book that, that it's that section of the CCS class that uh, PDCA came from. And then I just stumbled onto another article yesterday um, that also said that the CCS teachings were the foundation for PDCA. So now I've got two sources that kind of back that up. Um, and it was interesting. The There's a lot of uh, synergy between that course and Toyota as well. Um so as you get into, as you start to read the manual, um, one of the things they, uh, they talk about is there's um, some famous equations in all the Japanese books that uh, talk about cost. It's the first equation is cost plus profit equals selling price. So the idea behind that is as your costs go up, um, your selling price goes up. Um, if you want to increase your profit, you have to increase your, your selling price. The other equation is selling price minus cost equals profit. So it's, so it's a different view of, of what it's all about. So in today's world, who sets the selling price? The market. So the idea is if that if you want to raise your profit, you have to reduce your costs. Both of those equations come directly from the CCS manual. Okay. They're not written in equation form. They're, they're written out. Okay. But basically, both of those come from the manual, and both of those appear in many of the Japanese texts uh, later on that are tied into lean. So including Ono, including um, Shingo and other books. Wow. So we're to, to me, this is not rewriting history. This is revealing that. What happened? You know, this is important in, in the art of debriefing is looking back at what happened. And I believe, Charlie, you're presenting us with facts about what happened in, in, in the 50s 
going forward in the connections to the TPS that we didn't normally, or that we don't normally hear about in, in pop books or, or books by uh, lean uh, professionals. Uh, to me, this sounds foundational to some of the work that Boyd would look at back at later to help him construct the, the OODA loop. Uh, and your family heritage, your connection to this is one of the reasons we have you on here okay. is we want to help set the record straight. Uh, Mark, any thoughts on, on what you're hearing about this? Well, having uh, lived in Japan a significant time, I, th I think I've seen the end results of all the work because it was uh, astonishing to live there to see the uh, just ama you know just the amazing everything there. Uh, and that was you know twenty some years ago. I feel like uh, going back and learning all this. I feel like what was done in the time that you're talking about produced. The, the the marvelous place that I lived in and saw with my own eyes and, and have never forgotten. I always found it crazy that there was stuff that we had back in 1999 and 2000 in Japan that didn't come here until 10, 15 years later. And, and, and right. Charlie, can you, you can clarify a couple of points? The, the CCS program, it was a, was it a DOD program or, or how was that set up? Was it through, set up through a military? Yeah, it was set up through the military. So the, the, Supreme Commander of Allied Powers, known as SCAP. Yeah. So it was set up by by MacArthur. The CCS was set up by MacArthur and the military, as was this, um, as was this, the the whole CCS program. It was all under the guise of the military at the time. And so, wait a um, minute. The, the military influenced uh, what, or potentially influenced what is known as TPS today. Is that possible? Can we make that connection? Or, or had oh, I in think. It? I think you can definitely make that connection. Okay. And, and it was interesting because MacArthur's approach to the occupation was way different than any occupations I've seen since then. Um, and it, it didn't start out that way. There was a kind of an evolution in political thought as things were going. And it was Truman that eventually turned the tide and said, hey, we, we, want, to, we want the Japanese. We want to turn them around and make them successful. Um, so that that was part of this. Um, the other interesting part was that it wasn't until I met um, Professor Gatto um, in Japan, and that was back in, I think, 2017, that he started telling me the Japanese side of the CCS, which we never knew. And we're working on a book right now and working on getting his... Uh, his involvement in the book. The book was actually written by Ken Hopper and his brother Will, and um, they Ken passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, and his brother has Alzheimer's. But um, so I'm trying to carry that book forward. But one of the things we learned from Gatto was that the CCS teachings were going on the same time as the Deming teachings, and. Hopper told me that anybody that went to the Demings class after the CCS class didn't really learn anything new. It was kind of interesting because there was a big uh, piece of the quality part in the CCS teaching since obviously Schuert, you know, had an influence, uh, you know, with uh, on my grandfather as well, since he worked at Western Electric. So he he was familiar with all those teachings and new statistics inside and out. But I found out from Gatto that that class was actually continued on by JUSE uh, through 1976. And then at some companies, it was taught until 1993. So, so we were really surprised to find out that, 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 that the, those teachings had gone on that long, way beyond you know, Deming's time there. So we have a on the screen right now uh, some photos. I, I don't know if this is your grandfather who, who, who's in the photo. So my, my on the top photo, my grandfather is the one sitting down. Okay. Uh, and then the top right photo, he's the one on the left. All right. Uh, the left side. So that that is uh, that is a picture of them um, during the CCS training classes. Charlie, what 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 were they teaching? What what can you walk us through just some of the what was the what were the Japanese learning through CCS courses? So I'm I'm doing this from memory. I, I should go back and pull up the manual. But um they taught all aspects of American management. 
um, with uh, with organization policies and procedures. Um, they taught they actually taught participative management as part of the training. So that's where some of the bottom up stuff came from. Um, that also tied into Boyd. Um, so it was, it was literally all aspects of of American management that they taught in the in the class. And then as time went on, I guess as it, it evolved to the point where there's a quid pro quo or a fusion. Like you know, what we were talking about earlier, you know, the sort of the mutual learning of uh, some of the Japanese influence ideas or you know, uh, Eastern influence. It, the only reason I ask is it seems very radical from what what it, when you look at the evolution of things from uh, that time in in both countries. Having been to both, it seems very different in Japan sometimes. So, so Japan always had a different culture. There. Their culture was more hierarchical. Um, you, you basically did what the boss said. Mm. Um, so, introducing ideas around, um, you know, listening, listening to the to the people, um, th- those type of things were were more new, you know, at the time in Japan. Um, my grandfather actually wrote a section on leadership that was delivered as part of the the CCS manuals training um, where where he went into those those type of things hmm. I, I was also I mean just we don't want to go in a, a rabbit hole about Douglas MacArthur because we could talk about him for years but it seems I, I wonder was were his ideas and his foresight informed by his many 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 years uh, living in Asia, um, not just in Japan and other places. Um, and it was the idea that he had to bring all these thinkers in and do this. Was it, was it unpopular? You know, was it a, was, I mean, it was a very radical, seems to me it was a very radical move. You know, what was some of the, was there a lot of opposition to it or acceptance? How did that work? I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on, on MacArthur. I know that there was a secret directive that he was given um, and I, I think it was by Truman. Um, don't, uh, I would say, don't quote me on that. I'd have to go, <laughs> I, I have fine. it. I just don't have it at my fingertips, but the secret directive basically outlined most of what MacArthur did while he was over there. Hmm. Um, to get back, I, I pulled up the manual just to go back to the question he asked earlier. Um, so the, the manual actually got in uh, to, I just pulled it up, management policy. They talked about objectives of the enterprise. Um, and, and it was really interesting. There's a quote in there. To me, it's a kind of a famous quote to me. But um, it, it's, it was by Newport News Shipbuilding Company. Oh, no. And they, they, said, <laughs> they said, we build good ships here um, at a profit if we can at a loss if we must, but we will always build good ships. Hmm. All right. And, and that was, now remember this is back in the, you know, the forties or fifties and actually it had to be the forties. So um, that was one of the, the quotes in the manual. And, and I thought that was interesting to show the focus on quality that they had. Yeah. They also talked a lot about how companies had a duty to, uh, the social side or to the, to the community, um, as well. So that was also brought out in the course. Um, yeah. I find the irony in this because I believe Newport news, you know, the shipyards right up the road for me, well, not right up the road, it's about 30 miles away. Uh, you know, the USS Ford comes to mind and you talk about, uh, mm-hmm. a, a quality control problem. Uh, so I think, in, and I'm going to say this out loud here, being a naval officer at the moment uh, in the reserve, Newport News has lost their way uh, over the last 40 years, right? Something in our system has changed. So uh, American style management is taught to the to the Japanese. Uh, they evolve it. Uh, in my opinion, the Americans don't learn from it. We don't embrace these lessons that CCS was teaching over in Japan. At least that's that's my perspective, uh, both as a, as a military officer and as a consultant, uh, it's very hard to, 
to find these ideas still working well inside of U.S. organizations. Uh, any thoughts on that, Charlie? Yeah, I think I think there's a good uh, example of that. There's a, a, a training method known as TWI. Have you heard of that? Training within industry. Yep. Yes, I yeah, have. my dad. My dad did that for a year when he was in the army. So, so it's interesting. So it was, it was developed during World War II, um, uh, by a group known as the Four Horsemen, and they came up with this training process that is by far and away the best training process I've ever been exposed to. Um, you can teach people significant amounts of information in a very short period of time with a high level of retention um, using this method. And it was the idea is that you teach two hours a day for five days. And through the course, the people are practicing what they're learning as, um, as they're taught the, the different methods. And you can see their, their, training presentations get better each day throughout the week um, to where at the end of the week they're, they're, they're just spot on. And um, this, it was actually funny. I had I, actually run into to TWI back in the eighties. Um, and I asked Hopper what, you know, a question about something with training. And he said, Oh, uh, that's TWI. And I'm like, what's that? And he's like, oh, that's training within industry. He started explaining it to me. And that was before the books came out on TWI um, in the U.S. So the, the long kind of answer to the question is the, the TWI was also taught, uh, parts of it were taught uh, in the CCS course. They, they actually mentioned it in the CCS course. And I just found that link like, I've read the CCS manual over several times and little by little, I keep finding things that I didn't see before, but um, we taught TWI to the Japanese and it, it was taught separately to the Japanese outside the CCS um, class, even though it was mentioned in, in, in the manual, but um, training with industry became the core foundation of JKK at Toyota. Um, and don't ask me to pronounce the, the Japanese words, but the whole idea behind JKK is that the employee or the team member takes the ownership um, of the job, is accountable for the job, and is accountable for improving the job. And um, that comes from, that came from TWI. So, TWI became the foundation for what's known as standard work in Japan or at Toyota, not in Japan because not all Japanese companies are lean. Um, but at, at Toyota, Toyota took TWI and just built on it. And in the U.S., we forgot about it. Everybody came back after the war. And all you see today left of TWI are remnants of work instructions. Um, and that's about it. it. It it just had a resurgence here in the past 10 years or so. Um, but basically, when they got back after the war, we we just forgot about it, stopped teaching it. Wow. So now, um, now we're teaching it back again. Unbelievable. So I'm going to I want to transition over to uh, the archives and, and talking about Boyd here in a second. I also want to point out something about my experience with Toyota Production System and Lean. And that has to do with transitioning from the military into industry where you have to be familiar with the Toyota production system, the Toyota way uh, and other management concepts. The transition for me was simple or easy it, it, because a lot of the approaches that we learned in TPS or through the Toyota production system, we already use inside the military, right? We, we were already using that. We don't call it that, you know, we went through TQM, I think it was total, total quality management a long, long time ago. Um, we, we've experienced these things, but they're part of our culture. They're part of our DNA. We don't talk about Kanban. We don't talk about these things. We just live it. We see it in our flight schedules. Um, that's how we do work. It's just what we do. 
So when we transition over or guys like us transition over, we're, we look around like, why, why are you guys all excited about this? Well, I can see why, because you pointed out uh, many American companies lost this um, maybe in the 80s or 90s. I don't know when exactly, but, but they went away from that. So now we're asking them to do things like Agile or, or, or Scrum or Be Lean. And it, it's, it, it goes against their, what, are, what many people are learning in their MBAs and in school, the Tayloristic view of the world and things like that. So um, it, it is very, I don't know if I can say simple or easy. It's, it's, it's a nice transition to being veterans over to have them help coach organizations, especially if those veterans had experience in, um, in high performing uh, aspects of the military, uh, special operations, uh, leaders in, in, in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, fighter aviation. We, we find that there. So transitioning, everything you said with TWI, the connection to JKK, potentially, I, I've seen, well, I, having worked inside of Toyota several times, I've seen the connection. I'm like, yeah, this is obvious to me. It may not be obvious to other folks. So it's it's fascinating that you're able to connect that for us today. Uh, I want to transition over to, uh, let's go into the I think early eighties, maybe nineties, uh, and, and talk about the Toyota production system and, and how that started to emerge in American pop management culture books, if possible. Is, is, is that a good way to, to phrase that? Can, can you walk us through when we started to see TPS emerge inside of uh, the U S? So, t so it's interesting because I, I actually think going back to your earlier question and response that the, it was the MBA that was the undoing of a lot of American management, in my opinion. Um, and basically, I, I got my MBA back in 86, 87. And as I started to learn the, the, the Toyota system, I had to unlearn most of what I learned in my MBA class. Um, Concur. Yeah. yeah. So it was in my operations um, management textbook in my MBA training, which what, why I kind of brought this up, we went through all the traditional management and cost accounting and that type of thing, how you run your organization. And in the back of the book, there was about seven or eight pages that talked about this other system that was out there. And it was called uh, the Toyota production system. And there were a couple of companies experimenting with it. One, which was Hewlett Packard. Um, and and they had started experimenting it with it back in the the early 1980s. Um, it was uh, so so that'll bring up another that brings up another topic later. But so here we are learning all about this class, and basically at the end of the book it says they're they're doing this other type of thing in Japan, but it won't work here <clears throat> in the U.S. Yeah. So we didn't even cover that in the class. It was just there in the back of the book. Yeah, no, um, I absolutely agree with you on this. So, so in this, so after the oil crisis and the gas lines, which I actually remember back in 74, 75, um, is when the, the Toyota system started to become prevalent because as all the American manufacturers were struggling, um, Toyota was just chugging along. Um, and that led to a book by a guy named uh, Womack and uh, Jones, Dan Jones and Jim Womack wrote the book called Lean Thinking. And, and actually before that, they wrote, there was a book that Womack was involved in that was called The Machine to Change the World. And I think that came out around 80 something, 85 or somewhere around there. and. Um, the machine that changed the world was a five-year MIT study on the autom automotive industry. And that's where they really were able to bring out the difference between Toyota's production system and the American uh, automotive uh, production system at the time. Yeah. Um, and, and it was actually one of the books that Boyd, you know, yeah. commented on that we saw at the archives. Yeah, absolutely. And one of my favorite comments in there, and this is, remember, this is the book, The Machine That Changed the World, the story of lean production uh, that Charlie's talking about. One of the first comments that we see in there is from John Boyd. Uh, These comments don't agree with Shingo's or even Ono's accounts. They don't, they don't even mention Shingo, right? So here's John Boyd, uh, potentially mid-80s now reading this book. 
Uh, and, and of course, you and I know that uh, there's a huge connection between lean Toyota production system and John Boyd's thinking and, and, and based on the work that we've seen inside of his archives. And, and of course, the work that Chet Richards has done with uh, not just the lean community, but in his book, Certain to Win. Uh, but these comments, uh, when you first saw them, and remember, we we had met, I think, about a year prior or maybe six months prior, then we went up to uh, Quantico to look at the archives together. But can you walk us through what's going through your mind when you're in the archives looking at the machine that changed the world and you see all of John Boyd's notes uh, in the margins there? What are you thinking? So the so the archives, I could have stayed there, you know, forever reading over the stuff that he was writing. I mean, we we had limited time, so so we were just taking pictures as fast as we could of each of the books. We didn't even have time to really read all that he was saying. Um. You but, hit the um, nail on the head, Charlie. I, I was just there, and you could stay in there for months. <laughs> it, it was absolutely fascinating, and uh, I was I was always kind of curious where he stood on, you know, with PDCA because at the time we were we were going back and forth with PDCA and the OODA loop, and how did they all go together or interact, or was PDCA the same thing as the OODA loop and all those type things? And uh, the, the archives just blew me away, and and if you look at uh, when he read the books, and I don't know if you have a, you want to flash up one of those pictures of the books, but he outlined he outlined every single sentence, word, wrote comments in the corners and wrapped around the pages. Um, it was just it was just fascinating to see that and to kind of see his his thought process around that. Right. And, and further, um, our uh, listeners, I'm, I'm sharing a screen right now that has the image of John Boyd's copy of the machine that changed the world and a few pages that uh, uh, Charlie's describing here. And I'll scroll through this and we'll make this available for folks, um, not necessarily the notes that Charlie gave us, but we'll make the, uh, the video or these uh, images available. Yeah, this is astonishing um, to go through and read those. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. And I, I it was actually this podcast that forced me to kind of go back and put all that together um, to kind of refresh my memory since it had been a couple of years since we'd been there. But uh, it, it, it gives you quite an insight into John Boyd's mind and the critical thinking that he possessed at the time and how he processed information. And there are, are a lot of um, indirect and, and even one or two direct references to the OODA loop um, in the books that that we went through, were able to go through. I think I got through four or five of the different books um, that he had looked at. Um, so it was interesting to see that the, the OODA comments were, were in the books as well. Um, and uh, so, so anyway... Um, it, it was uh, it was really interesting, and and I used a lot of of his comments to kind of tie together uh, some of the thoughts with um, Toyota and how he linked to Toyota. Now, in all fairness to the guys that wrote the machine that changed the world, um, back then we didn't have the Shingo books uh, or the Mondin books or the Ono books available. Um, they didn't come till Norman Bodak brought them out, um, which was more in the eighties and nineties. And it was kind of the late eighties, nineties. It was really the hotbed for lean, um, and lean starting. And I think it was an interesting comment that Boyd made in one of these books. Um, and they took the name lean from a guy named John Krafik, I think is his name. Um, and, uh, Boyd said, something to the effect of, I can't believe they're calling this lean. <laughs> I don't remember the oh, exact boy. quote. Um, yeah. but I, but I picked that up as I went, as I went through this. So, uh, I thought that was interesting because the, the actual word lean has created its own set of problems as we, as yeah. we go through and try to implement it. Yeah. And you know, we, we, we've had conversations with John Boyd's daughter, uh, Mary Ellen, and she was very clear that John Boyd, selected words uh, because of meaning, right? Words mean things. And mm -hmm. he's very, everything in his briefs, every word in there was cautiously selected, right? 
And I could see him commenting on something like this as lean. Now to the lean community, you know, I get a lot of pushback from the lean community that the Duda loop is, is crazy. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. It's for the military. It's, it's only for killing uh, other aircraft or whatever. They just, there, there are folks that just will not open up their minds and pick up a book and read or listen to something, right? The same people that are professing uh, or that profess diversity of thought, weak signal detection, listening to those that are closest to the customer will not listen to people that are outside, right? And that's the whole point of John Boyd's, one of the whole points of John Boyd's OODA loop is you got to go outside. You got to look outside of what you know. And I think that's the the journey that I, I saw uh, you and I go on because my journey was really trying to understand TPS and, and your journey is really trying to understand the OODA loop. Uh, but I do want to go back to the uh, some of the comments in the books because I think this really drives home a lot of the foundation behind John Boyd's thinking when he eventually sketches the OODA loop, you know, about 20 years after or 15 years may, after he starts studying TPS. May, may I ask one question, Charlie, before, I mean, sure. we, we just unpack a little bit. You mentioned it at the beginning, but we unpack your dis, the disruption that Ponch brought to you when he starts talking about Boyd and OODA. What was it that really disrupted your, your, your thinking to the point where you got interested in digging deeper on this? Like, what was it about it that really caught you and, and, and brought you into, uh, digging deeper on Boyd. So Ponch hit me with a lot in an eight hour session <laughs> <laughs> between Kinevin and Uda. I, I was like, I'm in a different world. You know, all of a sudden my world just opened up to the world of complexity and, and this, this Uda loop thing. And, uh, and, and Ponch has some great, great training slides on, on that material. And, and, and the OODA loop and, uh, and then the ties into, you know, Sullenberg, what happened with Sullenberger and, and some of those other things. So that to me was just, just really opened up my mind. And then the first thing we started thinking, well, the OODA loop, that's not really any different than PDCA. And then we had a lot of discussions around that and Ponch is like, you guys are crazy. It's not the same thing. And, and then the more we started to learn about it, the, the more we started to understand how the, how the OODA loop functioned and, and all the feedback loops. And I've been studying it ever since. Um, ever since that class, I literally went through and listened to every single video, the John Boyd's eight hour briefing. And I actually want to go back and listen to it again, but I took, you know, copious notes on it. Um, as we went through and started identifying the linkages between TPS and also between Kinevin. And uh, the, the guy was really just a brilliant thinker and way ahead of his time. Um, and and I, I've even, you know, the idea of entropy and uh, closed systems and how, how companies can end up in that situation, you know, that when companies get complacent, they basically become a closed system. They stop getting information from the outside. And one of the, the, the biggest thing I picked up from, from going through the books was Boyd's comments around, you have to get outside the system. You, you can't change it from inside the system. You've got to get outside. And we now use the OODA loop in all our training sessions, um, but we use it a different way. And because we're, most of the stuff I do is in the complicated domain, which took me a while to understand the differences between the complicated and the complex side of things. But um, in the complicated domain, you know, PDCA works. Um, but what I have found um, over the years implementing the Toyota system is that uh, the OODA loop actually explains a big part of why a lot of lean implementations fail. And there's the the feedback that's known as implicit guidance and control from uh, the orient block directly to act. And uh, that is the, the loop that Gary, I think that Gary Klein talks about with his rapid prime decision making. And what I have found when it comes to change management is that's where I use the OODA loop to actually explain why we have problems um, 
with companies today, why we have fire, all this firefighting and, and all this reactive management. And one of the things I've noticed from or learned from tacit knowledge over the 30 or so years that I've been doing this is that when there's a problem, people just want to throw a solution at it. They don't want to take the time to study it. They just want to throw a solution at it. Hmm. And in some in some cases, you know, uh, in Gary Klein's world with first responders and those type of things, um, it's extremely valuable. But they have the orientation and the training behind it to support the decisions that they make. Um, and um, where they don't, that's a lot of the work Don Vandergrift's been doing with uh, object-based learning or objective-based learning is actually, you know, teaching people how to work rapidly without knowing the solution, you know, to come up with the solutions, that type thing, but just teaching people that, that process. Um, but the example I use in my training class is if, if you have a fire, what's the first thing people do? And the answers I get back are either run or throw water on it. So we all know, you know, if there's a fire, you throw water on it. So then I ask people, okay, what if it's a grease fire? And now I've just thrown water on it. What happens? Yeah. You, you, and uh, it's a mess. It's like throwing gas on it, yeah. So my experience in comp working with companies is 80 to 90% of the time, People, when they run into a problem, are going down that implicit guidance and control path. And if if they have the right answer, they'll fix it. If they have the wrong answer, it gets worse or it just you know stays the same. And mm -hmm. what I've been looking for all this time is kind of the linkage to prove that 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 eighty to ninety percent of what I see is actually you know true. That that's what you know that's what people do. So I don't know. You know, if the brain science is there to support that or not, but um, I, I think it is I, I, because yeah. uh, the the efficiency of the brain, right? We're looking for shortcuts, such heuristics, implicit guidance, control. If we if it's an autonomic response or automatic response, uh, that's the pathway we're going to go on. Uh, in, in the way we look at the Italy. it's not well, something. Yeah, it's a lower energy. Yeah, it's lower energy. Uh, it's, it, it it doesn't defy human nature, right? You don't have to really try that hard. You just have to execute what you already know. So that's the tendency. That's where we're going to gravitate towards when we see problems in, in the complicated domain. And, and, and as you say, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of water being thrown on grease fires uh, more often than not. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and then what I so to me the go ahead, Punch. I think the other connection is remember when you, we look at Kinevin, if we use the wrong approach, that puts us in could put us in disorder. Uh, the, the part right. where we can't make the connection. So that's what's happening is sometimes our, the lessons that we understand to be true, and remember the complicated domain of the Kinevin framework is subject matter experts, uh, but make sure you protect your mavericks. There's always a, it's, it's the land of good practices, right? It means there's always something better out there. Uh, if you apply those approaches, you're going to run into disorder and potentially run yourself into chaos. And, and that's what I believe you're trying to, or how you're connecting this with me right now is that's the pathway we're going on between uh, the OODA loop, Kinevin, uh, and, and applying lean in organizations. Yeah, and when you're in when you're in simple, and 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 you throw a solution at a problem, it can easily, like you're saying, take you into chaos. You know, and that's that big cliff. Um, so, so the to me, this is kind of the when you get into the Toyota connection to this and, and, and the Boyd piece of it, I think, you know, PDCA is that, is a center path, right? Where you're going, you're going from observe to orient to hypothesis to act or decision to act. That's the PDCA route. If it works, you get, you know, a feedback loop back to observe. And if it doesn't work, you also get a feedback loop back to observe. But, if it doesn't work, you're going to go back through the path again. So the, the, the PDCA loop takes energy to go down that path. And to me, what Toyota's done is through their application of 
TWI, and I think a lot of things that actually came from the CCS class and then Deming and Duran and others, um, uh, what they have done is taken through standard work or basically made standard work kind of like implicit guidance and control. So, so at Toyota, if there's a problem, you follow PDCA. That's the, the kind of the standard work for it. So when you have a problem, it's, it's implicit guidance and control to use the PDCA loop, if that makes right. sense. Right. Whereas yes. most companies, it's not there. That, that they just jump to a solution. They don't go through to try to fix it. So Toyota has standardized on PDCA and ingrained it and its muscle memory in the company, also known as A3. You know, the A3 approach are using A3s where they tell the, the problem-solving story on an a 3 size piece of paper. Um, but to me, that's what <clears throat> Toyota's been able to do that most other companies haven't. And that's to get people to constantly go down that path. Now, my guess is, you know, Toyota still probably has instances where people don't do that, like every company. But for the most part, through all the training that they do, that's that's the path that that people go down. So I want to point out something else that we can pull from the archives and talk about Toyota and what's important to today's businesses. And I'm going to share a screen here so we could take a look at this collectively. And we'll share this with our, uh, our our viewers, our listeners as well. So control. Uh, John Boyd, as he's looking at the book Kaizen, I, I don't remember the author of this, and he, and he says this many times throughout his journey of looking at the Toyota production system, and you can see it in the Zoodaloo. But control is exerted from the bottom up, not the top down, right? So the way I read this and the way we coach this is control of your organization is outside in, bottom up. You're customer, if you have one, will control you, right? And, and so we see this a, a few times throughout um, Boyd's notes there. Uh, and he also points out that con quality control, I believe, is outside and bottom up. It's it's from the customer's perspective. Yeah, up, upstream again for Toyota quality or total quality control. Uh, they're connected to their environment, their customer, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So he keeps coming back to this idea that uh, control is outside in, bottom up, from the environment. Is, is that consistent with what you're coaching organizations and consistent with what you understand from TPS? Yes, and the, the environment that he talks about is another reference back to the OODA loop. Right. Um, so the, the idea of organizational planning, and some of this came from the CCS manual as well, is that the the direction of the company is set at the top um and toyota for instance when they're doing their planning they use something called hoshin planning mm -hmm. which i think um was was really formally developed by goodrich um and uh the idea behind hoshin planning is the the company sets the initial targets and then um as it goes down the organization, they play something called catch ball where uh, the, the targets kind of go back and forth. So from bottom up, they say, here's what we think we can do. Top down is saying, here's what we would like to do. And then they agree on somewhere in between where they end up. And at the end, um, if you're doing Hoshin planning right, the employee on the floor actually knows how what they're doing is contributing to the overall company and to the company's goals or targets that they've set. So there's this linkage literally from bottom up. The other idea that um, Boyd points out as he's reading through some of these books where the authors got it wrong is that the standards that are developed at Toyota are really developed. It, it's And Ono talked about this. It's it's the employees that develop the standards. They're the ones doing the job. So you work with them to develop the standards. And, and again, in JKK, it's the employee's job to improve the standards. So the standards aren't coming from top-down command and control. And this ties into the whole idea of leader's intent. Right. Um, 
you know, and those, those type things. So it's how do you get your organization can be much more agile with leaders intent versus uh, command and control. And the comment that I put up there is management may monitor standards, but in the end, workers set standards and cough up new ones. Unless we treat the workers as robots who only take orders and have no ideas on, of their sure. That's from uh, John Boyd. And that's the comment I think you were just uh, talking about, right? Right, Charlie? Right. Yep. yep. Yeah. It seems like you're talking about an environment that is uh, learning, constantly learning. And it is. You're 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 always constantly learning and and Toyota has uh Steve Spears um who is an MIT who's an MIT professor said this in a video a while back he said T Toyota always has this like healthy paranoia hmm. and and they they when they actually became the number one car maker they were actually panicked um, because they were afraid that they were going to lose, uh, that they were going to lose that drive to overcome complacency, and they are the, the leadership is always coming up with ways to keep the company fearful of the competition, um, and always looking for ways to keep driving improvements through the organization, and. Mm -hmm. To me, that ties in uh, with all of Boyd's work where he talks about the healthy tension that's required, because if you don't have the tension, you're not going to drive the change, which is all tied into the conceptual spiral. So yeah. that, that, that healthy paranoia is about always looking at destroy and create, you know, the snowmobile idea. Right. How, how, do we keep, how do we keep the company just always – looking for mismatches and looking for ways to keep improving. Um, and I think that's what you saw with the Prius when the hybrid came out, that was kind of their snowmobile. Now they're mm. doing it with the hydrogen car. You saw it with the uh, kind of the helicopter with Uber, you know, that when Toyota invested in Uber. Um, so you see these, these, it, it's, it's just always looking for, trying to drive the mismatches and the opportunities to improve. And, and I think that's one of the things that Boyd really identified with Ono and that Ono was the guys on the floor friend. He, he loved the guys on the floor management. Not that he didn't love them, but, but he drove management. I mean, he drove those guys. He would make them stand in a circle for up to eight hours or more until they saw the waste and saw the things that he wanted them to see. It, it, it was really fascinating. So he was relentless with the management team. And it was all about what can you do to support the worker and make their job easier and make good quality cars. What are some, what are some good examples, Charlie, just to paint contrast for people that are listening? You know, what are, what are some companies that didn't do those things that were extremely vulnerable because they, they didn't have that state of alertness or state of uh, healthy paranoia where they're always trying to get better. Um, are there any examples that you could think of that people could relate to where, you know, they opened themselves up to, a, a, you know, presented themselves as a massive target to competitors because they weren't doing these things? Well, there's, there's a bunch and a lot of them are profiled by a guy named Joel Barker um, who had, a lot of videos back in the day on paradigms and uh, paradigm pioneers and those type things. And one of the things he profiles there is the Swiss watch industry hmm. and how during their heyday, they had 80 to 90% of the market. And, um, you know, then, then uh, at that time, all the watches were made with gears and were very precision oriented and, and the Swiss had all this infrastructure around that paradigm. And then the digital quartz watch came out. And all of a sudden that became the new paradigm. And the Swiss watch manufacturers, for most intensive purposes, lost that 80% of the market to mm. Japan and Texas Instruments. The interesting part about that story is, do you know who who invented the digital quartz or the, the quartz movement watch. Was it the Swiss? 
It was the Swiss themselves. Yeah. And, like it's they, almost like a Kodak discovering it. digital photography story. <laughs> yeah, they introduced it to the Switch Watch Congress, Congress and didn't even protect it. And basically gave it away to the competition because that could never be the future of watches. Huh. Uh, that's a, and it goes on. Go ahead. That, that's, that's relatable. I mean, you see, I'm, I'm wearing a, a one at the moment, but I have to tell you that this one – Compared to the um, uh, the Orient Watch Company, which is owned by I think Seiko, that I bought when I was living over there, mm-hmm. it's an automatic movement and it's never been serviced and it keeps perfect time. Uh, whereas a you know Swiss watch is a <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. Sometimes you got to go send it back and get serviced. But that is fascinating um, and very relatable. Um, yeah, and Seiko is the company that took it. Yeah, wow, well, that's awesome. It's amazing. Always uh, compensating induced failure, right? Uh, I want to head back to the outside in, bottom up control and leadership moment. So John Boyd, while he's looking at these books, and there's several books that he, he that are in the archives, he, he starts talking about leadership as um, excuse me, command is leadership and appreciation. And I think that's what you're pointing out. There's there, there is uh, through the stories you told about the eight hours uh, in, in, from Ono. The the idea here is that leaders need to attend to like a garden. And we know this from um, the book of five rings that uh, leadership is leading like a gardener, right? You set the conditions. Uh, But in the Toyota production system, we also have Kaizen and we have Kanban. So Kaizen, from what I read, when John Boyd's looking at these books, he says that um, Kaizen Kaizen is first bottom up and then top down. Um, Your thoughts on that? Uh, Well, it absolutely, it it absolutely is the, there's a, there's a distinction though in, in the word Kaizen because Kai, the word Kaizen means different things. Um, in, in the U S Kaizen is most often associated with something called Kaizen events and Kaizen events are typically a five day event, uh, where there's a day or half day of training, three days of go do on the floor, make improvements, and then a management report out with a pizza lunch. <laughs> um, at the end. And that's what most Americans uh, associate with Kaizen. And, and that's how most uh, lean, whatever you want to call them, masters, practitioners uh, practice is that type of event. Um, excuse me. Somewhere along the line that got lost because Toyota doesn't do Kaizen events per se. Mm. Um, and if, if they do, it's a very minimal percentage. So, um, Toyota in, at Toyota Kaizen is changed for the better. And it's basically gradual. It's a gradual change. It's incremental change. Um, so it's, it's every day looking for something to improve. So it's, it's building a culture of continuous daily improvement where you're engaging uh, and challenging the people a hundred percent of the time. Hmm. And it's always challenging to come up with new ideas, new ways to do things and, and ways to improve the process. Which is um, very boy. Which is, <laughs> yeah. Which is very different from that, that Kaizen event process. So it's, when I go into companies and, and explain kind of what that difference means, most companies are, are surprised to find that out. And that when I ask them, you know, what would it take you to develop a culture where every day you're getting ideas from people on the floor and you're challenging them for ideas and, and they own the ideas and they own the improvement, you know, what does it take to put that kind of culture in place? Um, and, to me, that's a that, to me that's a debriefing culture, right? That's the the if you look at the OODA loop, separating your decisions from your outcomes, looking back at what happened, that situational awareness, and and, mm-hmm. and you put this in your new book, um, some debriefing tips uh, that, that can help uh, companies build this continuous improvement mindset. It's one percent kaizen mindset inside their organization, uh, but but I'm seeing the same thing that you are in in the safety world. They borrow from the Kaizen events that you talk about and they have these learning teams that these folks come in and they, they know how to 
look at something and really understand what's going on. That to me, that's okay. That that's okay. But that's not the fundamental way you coach accountability, the ability to recount what happened. Um, how do we look back from multiple perspectives and figure out what's happening or what happened, what's happening now and, and improve our performance in the future. And this goes back to the point about transitioning veterans over from the military into the civilian world. We we're pretty good at, most of us are pretty good at uh, the art of debriefing, uh, looking back, understanding what happened, looking for potential causal factors or root cause, depending on the context we're in, and then improving that. This is not happening inside organizations, right? And I think that's what you and I talked about a few years ago, is we have to coach these human factors, these social skills, so we can empower or, or help those closest to the customer improve performance and deliver value rapidly. And not only at, not only at that level closest to the customer, but throughout the organization, they have to learn how to do this Kaizen, um, which I believe you're saying it's continuous. And if you think back to uh, things like Scrum, uh, where every two weeks you reflect back on, or every week you look mm -hmm. back on what happened to improve the, the future, continuous improvement means continuous improvement. It's not every two or three weeks, right? So I, I'm just sharing my little bit of my venting some of my frustration of what's going on around the world right now with you. Uh, is this what you're seeing as well when it comes to, to Kaizen events that it, there's another aspect of this that we need to coach organizations on? Yeah, for sure. And, and to unpack a couple of things that, that you went through, one of the things that Ritsuo Shingo taught us when we were over on our trip to Japan was the first the first thing that American management wants to do is find out who's to blame, whose fault was it. And the first thing Ritsuo teaches is don't blame the worker. Because once you blame someone, you never get to the root cause. Mm -hmm. So the the idea is it's about process, not people. And to really do, you know, lean or TPS, um, and they should be the same thing, is you have to win the hearts and minds of the people um, in addition to the processes, which also ties in with Boyd. So if you think about what Toyota's done, if you talk to anybody anywhere that's worked for Toyota, you know, they love the company. Mm -hmm. They just love working there. They love being there. And I think that ties into what Boyd said. If, if you get the people, you don't need the terrain or the tanks. You right. Know, you have to win the people. And, and I think that's part of the success of their system. Um, they also look at the next process as the customer. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to deliver something to that next step in the assembly process that's wrong. So the idea is you never pass on a bad part to your customer or to the next process. And that's, mm -hmm. that's ingrained in the organization. And to go, go back to your point about TQM. Um, and, and this is something that my grandfather talked, talked a lot about. Um, TQM was total quality management, but in Japan, they didn't roll out TQM. They rolled out TCWQM which was total company-wide quality control. And there's a book mm. by a guy named uh, Professor Kondo, who I actually met with in Tokyo when I was in Japan. Um, and he was telling me about some of my grandfather's work over there. But he was explaining to me the difference that in Japan, what we call TQM was applied, applied to the entire company, whereas in the U.S. it was basically just applied to the shop floor. And, and in American management, it's 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 okay if we do it to them as long as they don't do it to us. Yes, yeah. you know, and and um, lean is great as long as as long as they don't come to our our process. Huh. And it's kind of interesting. So um, that was a big difference in the application of TQM, and I think why TQM failed for the most part in the U.S. was it wasn't looked at as a company wide system. Mm. It's like, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, right? I agree with you. We've seen this in the past in the sports teams when they don't uh, take on social, excuse me, soft skills training throughout mm. the organization. Uh, today's agile movement, you always hear, even agilists will talk about at the team level, at the team level. I'm like, what does that mean? 
And by the way, the people that have the highest level of task interdependence are up at the top of the organization, right? So when you need team training skills, your C-suite needs it more than anybody else. But yet, to your point, Charlie, it seems to be that everybody looks at these uh, silver bullets, these frameworks that are out there, these approaches is from, from a management standpoint. This is what we need to train our people on so they do it. And that's not true, right? This is, what you're saying is the whole organization. Right. And if the okay. leaders fight, to your point, Punch, if the leaders fight, you see it in the people underneath them because they're fighting against the other yeah. guy. And, and you see that all that, the time in companies. You see it. Yeah, there's almost like a there's like a management firewall between uh, and a lot of the things that you're talking about, like a Kaizen event. It sounds like really it's just an ornament on a tree that's really just Taylorism hiding behind um, some of these, you know, Ponches used the term pop, pop business. It's like they they hide the uh, sort of the reductionist Tayloristic approach behind some of these things. Yeah, and Taylor Taylor wasn't a bad guy. Um, you know, T- Taylor basically came up with the idea of, of scientific management, scientific right. method. Um, the, the, it was interesting because because Taylor and Gilbert are the foundation for TPS. Mm-hmm. You know, and and the Japanese learned about Taylor. You know, way back back in the early 1900s, when 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 he was publishing stuff, they were translating it, and and same with Gilbert. Mm-hmm. The, the 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 interesting thing to me though is that to me Taylor was the father of time study, Gilbert was the father of motion study, and it's interesting today in industrial engineering classes. I don't think they teach Taylor and Gilbert much because when I ask people that come out of industrial engineering school, a lot of times they don't remember who those people were, but but that was really the foundation for all of this. Taylor Taylor came up with what a shovel should look like, what a mop should look like. Um, hmm. He came up, he actually patented the um, grass on the putting green. He came up with high speed <laughs> steel. Um, the, the guy was a genius. I mean, he came up with all different kinds of things. The, the, the problem is his approach with the worker was, you know, I'll watch you and I'll figure out what you need to do. And then you do it and I'll pay you more. Hmm. Gilbert came at it from a different tact. So Gilbert, Gilbert had a brick building business um, and built, you know, houses or whatever, uh, or places out of bricks. And he did motion study with bricklayers. So if you think about construction, it's probably one of the hardest places to do this. But it's all the stuff that we call lean today. He came up with adjustable scaffolding where the workers could always stay at the same level as the wall was being built and Mm. reduce the motions literally to exactly how you pick up a brick, how you put on the the concrete, uh, and then build the wall. And it's interesting in that with, if you reduce the motions, you actually, it's a win-win for the worker and for management. You're making their job easier and you're getting things done quicker. Mm, so I would say lean, energy. <laughs> yeah, lean is more, it's about 80%, 90% motion study and 10% time study. It's like 10% Taylor, 90, 80, 90% Gilbert. An mm. interesting part is Gilbert and Taylor lived at the same time. And Taylor would teach classes every Sunday on, on the scientific method, scientific management. And Gilbert actually uh did a lot of the trainings for him on those Sundays if Taylor wasn't around. And then eventually they had a falling out on their approaches um, and they split. Uh, but Gilbert also used video um, and uh, pictures and that type thing with his workers, which is what we do today. Mm-hmm. So a, a lot of the things that Gilbert did ended up in the Shingo books and, um, and then uh, became the foundation for how we're implementing it today. Hmm. So motion versus time reminds me of tempo versus speed, right? Tempo, mm-hmm. we favor tempo over speed. We fa- in this case, we favor uh, inside looking at lean, looking at motion over time. Is is there a parallel there? Oh, I would think so because you. W- one of the things we say is 
is quality first. The, quality first, the speed will come. And and if you go after speed first, it's a mess. So it's 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 all about it's it comes in with when you're training people in standard work or or really when you're implementing anything there's there's always that learning curve and you have to give people the ability or the time to learn and and as you do your your quality will get better so quality quality safety um all are all integrated with lean you you can't it doesn't do any good to get to increase your production volume 50 to 80 percent because you can build a lot of bad parts really fast so it's it's yes. Hmm. It, you got to build a lot of the, the wrong you thing, have to yeah. you have to build the quality into the system and that that was the judoka part of the house uh which which really R- ritsua said he was really upset that they changed it from built in quality to judoka um hmm. because it's built in quality is really what it's all about judoka was a way to do that um so he thought he thought Jadoka was more, even though it was really important, it was more of a misnomer that it really should have stayed built in quality. So they, so uh, the two pillars that you're talking about, Jadoka and the second, and we're talking about TPS or the Toyota Way. I get confused all the time. This is well, it's it's TPS, which is which is the Toyota Way, but it's it's the the. The, well, Toyota Way, I know what you're talking about. So Toyota Way was, you know, respect for people. Um, the the TPS house was just in time in Jadoka. Okay. And then so we have, okay. is that the critical Those were difference? The yeah. What, what would be the critical differences between Toyota production and Toyota Way that you'd want people to know? The the Toyota Way, I think, was more of the was more of the people based versus the tools based mm. so the toyota production system i mean this is just i'm just thinking about this out loud but the toyota production system had the, had the foundation of standard work hey junko which is level loading um uh, tpm total productivity maintenance all, all those type things and then you had the two pillars and then at the top was respect for people um and the toyota way expounded on the respect for people piece <clears throat> so I want to expand on the uh, the two pillars in, in, for, on just in time and Jadoka and make a connection back to potentially Kanban and what Boyd pointed out in some of these uh, notes we have. So Kanban, uh, we, would you mind walking us through that real fast? So you know, I know that a lot of listeners are lean listeners, but there may be some folks that are new to this type of thinking. Sure. So so Kanban. Um, basically is uh, an information signal or trigger. So the, again, Kanban has the word Kanban has is used in different ways, um, even though it's the same word. So within a system, you can, within a Kanban system, you also have Kanbans. So, um, Basically, the idea behind Kanban is that the um, as the later process uses the parts from the earlier process, the earlier process then produces what the later process took in the amount that the later process took it. So it's it's inventory or whip or work in process that is between two lines, if you will, and this, this can be, um, this can be physical processes or informational processes as well, but it's, 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 it's in between, um, two processes and it's, it's a way of connecting processes that aren't interconnected. So they use the inventory as a way to connect the processes. So the simplest example of a Kanban system is something called a two bin system. Um, and then a two bin system, uh, I, I have two bins on a rack. And as uh, the first bin empties out, the second bin comes down. The empty bin now, the first bin that became empty is now my Kanban or my trigger that I need to replenish that bin. That trigger then goes back to either a shelf 
where uh, they pick up another bin that already has parts. That's called a withdrawal Kanban. Or it goes back to the actual production process and triggers them to fill the bin with the parts that they're making in that cell. That's called a production ordering Kanban. And then there's there's six or eight other types of Kanbans. Um, and there's a good book on that. It's called Toyota Productions, Production System by Mondin that he goes through a very in-depth explanation of all those types of Kanbans. Um, there's also the Kanban system you have in Scrum, yeah. um, which is the same idea, only the, the whip is your yellow stickies on the, on the, on the wall. Yeah. Um, so, so in essence, that's, that's what Kanban is. It's a way to link processes. But the goal, the, the real goal is to eliminate the need for the Kanban by connecting the processes directly. So that I don't need the whip because one thing about excess material is it's always hiding a problem. Right. So the, the challenge is to find the problem. So in, in that case, it's hiding the problem that the, the two lines aren't connected directly. So I have to connect them with this inventory. Yeah. So we use Kanban quite a bit. In fact, uh, let me just show you this real fast. You might get a kick out of it. Uh, you can see this is our basic board for the, show uh, no way out you can see i mean just tell me real fast what do you see what what tell me where the big problem is i i can't read it it's too small but my guess okay. is you probably have a lot of stuff in process at the same time yeah yeah we have a lot we're batching right now uh we're, we're doing a lot of recordings at the moment and then we have this space that's empty there's like a bottleneck there between uh editing and assets right so our, we're working on our process still. We're, we're still trying to evolve and, and improve. And eventually, going back to your point, the per, I believe you said this, the purpose of Kanban is to basically eliminate, eliminate itself, go single piece flow, which we right. don't have at the moment, right? Okay. So we're using that here for our show. Um, and you're right. A lot of folks do use it for uh, using things in, in, quote, unquote, the agile um Project management, I'll call it that for now, uh, even though it's not supposed to be that. Uh, but John Boyd talked about Kanban. Uh, he looked at that several times. He also looked at JI, no, excuse me, not, not JIT, but uh, J, uh, Jidoko. And the way I was taught Jidoko was it's automation with the human touch. Uh, right. Can you, is that is that still, am I, am I wrong in that? or, or can No, you no, the, there's no English word for it. So they call it autonomation. Um, okay. but that, that's basically what it is. So it's, it can be applied to machines or people. So with people, it's the and on cord that people pull or today it's the okay. button they push at Toyota and with machines, it's how do I make smart machines that can stop preferably before they make a mistake or worst case after they make a mistake, uh, like in a CNC machine, if a tool breaks, the machine stops, it doesn't just crash and or, or continue to produce bad parts. Um, and Toyota spent 60, 70 years working on that. The idea of Jidoka came from Sakichi Toyota, the Toyota T-O-Y-O-D-A Loom Works, um, where uh, he developed the, the um, what is it, the press, you know, the for the, the sewing, sewing machines. Um, where uh, if a thread broke, a metal um, clip would drop down and stop the machine. Right. So it was that invention that really led to Jadoka. And uh, they actually got to a point where one person could run 40 of those looms by themselves. Right. Uh, so it's, it's whenever you see a worker watching a machine in a factory, and you ask them, why are you, why are you standing there watching the machine? And they say, oh, the machine might break or there might be a problem with the machine and I need to listen to it and all this other stuff. Basically, they don't have Judoka in place. Okay. <clears throat> that makes sense. Charlie, I got a couple loaded questions for you. Um, and this connects back to my working time with the creator of Scrum. And, and that's Jeff Sutherland, uh, former fighter pilot. And he talks about or wrote about in his book. Uh, several of his books that uh, Scrum came from the Toyota production system and the OODA loop of fighter aviation. Now, after today's conversation, I can I'll say this: Scrum came from the OODA loop because the I believe the OODA loop is informed 
by TPS Lean and a lot of the work that your uh, grandfather has done. Would you, any thoughts on that statement? So, I, as you know, I'm not a scrum, I'm a scrum master, but I'm not a scrum expert. Um, I think, um, I think, I, I know, I think, I don't know all about the, the I've read Sutherland's books, I don't, but I don't know all about, I know the, the origin of Scrum came from the Japanese uh, professors and those type mm -hmm. things. Yep. So um, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if I can answer that question directly. Can, okay, can you ask it another this? way? Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you another question a after, you know, our discussion today and, and what we've talked about over the last couple of years, the way I look at it is the Toyota production system and even lessons from your grandfather and CCS have informed John Boyd's view on the OODA loop before he sketched it. Right. So, so they're not, to me, they're not separate anymore. They're, it's if you look at the OODA loop as a whole and you want to learn a lot, you're going to learn TPS, right? You have to learn TPS to understand the OODA loop. That's, that's another way to state, uh, another way to state that. Uh, it, would you agree with that now that, you know, after this journey of looking at the OODA loop and, and living TPS and CCS and lane, why would any lean practitioner need to look at the, 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 uh, the OODA loop now, or e even if you're not a lean practitioner? So I don't know. I don't know that I would agree that you have to learn TPS. I have to think about that one to understand the OODA loop. I think you would have to, I think to really understand the OODA loop, um, and how it applies to TPS or lean, you would have to know that and you would have to be familiar with PDCA to make all those connections. Um, it's kind of like, it's, it, I think it goes back to that orientation block. Um, and, and like when we were talking in Quantico about Kinevin, if, if Kinevin isn't even part of your orientation, there is no real connection at least with the individual, because they don't even know it exists. Um, but once you know it exists, now now it's a whole different story. And I think the OODA loop is the same way. I think once the OODA loop becomes part of your orientation, the, the connections and the interplay and the interrelationships that come out of it become very apparent. Um, at least they have to me. Um, the because I, I was familiar with TPS and when you first went through the OODA loop, I immediately went to PDCA, right? And I was, I was struggling trying to figure out, okay, what's different between this and, and PDCA. And, and then it became really apparent that, that the OODA loop was way bigger than just PDCA. And that, that Boyd was really kind of a, ahead of his time when it came to complexity thinking, mm. um, you know, we agree with in, that. The, <laughs> in the complex domain, there was a lot of things that he brings up that, that Dave talks about, you know, um, even, even his, his whole destroy and create isn't all that far off the apex predator theory that Dave has, right? It, it's to me and the conceptual spiral, it's the conceptual spiral is just, you're constantly doing apex predator or you're constantly doing destroy and create. Um, so I, I, I don't know that you would have to be, I don't know that you would have to know TPS to get UDA, but I do think once you got UDA, TPS makes a whole lot of sense. If it, isn't, it, isn't it amazing how the widespread thought on Boyd is a reductionist to just look at UDA loop as if it were some process that you would use in a tactical situation and they completely don't understand the depth and the scope and the, the pioneering approach that you're mentioning on com complexity science, you know, for people like the three of us that have been in the archives and have seen w where this guy's mind was, it's so far beyond even what I learned about him when I was an officer in the Marines and my, my, my world completely opened up. Um, when I started seeing the practical applications and capital markets and the fluctuations of things and just the, the constant flow of things. 
And, and um, when I got into the, you know, my master's in economics, when I got into that and I, I started piecing back, I'm like, wait a minute, this sounds like what John Boyd was talking about. And this sounds like war fighting. And then it's so much more than, oh, it's the OODA loop. And I'm going to use it in this situation. And oh, I'm not going to use OODA here. Uh, Boyd was not an academic. He's a moron. And, and you get into it and you just see that this guy is so misunderstood by so many. Well, the other part, so we, so, I mean, you're using the OODA loop all the time, whether you know it or not. Yeah. Right? That's a, so yeah. first off, actually, yeah. and then we use that, we use the OODA loop with lean sales when we're teaching lean and sales. Um, I've actually been tell, working tell on us, this. Tell uh, us more about that. Yeah. Unpack that. So there's a company that we've been working with called Shoots International. They make uh, um, they make shoots for for laundry systems, like in buildings or trash shoots uh, hmm. in buildings. And they're a local company in Baltimore that we've been working with now for, I guess, four or five years going on. And uh, the sales manager there is a guy named Doug Gallion, and very progressive thinker, and you know me, Ponch, as I learn stuff, I look for ways to go apply it right away. So this this was a company that I could go kind of experiment with, practice with, and 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 they knew that when I went in. I told Doug, hey, I'm learning this stuff. Um, let's look at ways that maybe we can make this work, you know, for you guys. And I was also at the same time uh learning about lean design and uh and R and D and those type things. So uh so I started teaching him about the OODA loop and I said, you know, you need to look for ways to find mismatches with your competition and where can you get inside their loop uh, and come up with products and services that they can't respond to right away. Kind of that Ashby's law or the reversal of Ashby's law uh, principle kind of thing. And, uh, and I don't want to go too far down that path because I'll give away some things that I don't want to give away. But we started looking at ways that they could introduce things that maybe their competitors couldn't respond to right away. And and as a you know, as opposed to even doing it all in one shot, why don't you do it just, you know, this year you do this, next year you do this, next year you do this, and you just keep hitting them with things that they can't respond to. So we we started going through that kind of training. We also went through uh at Toyota they do something called trade off curves where they'll actually study a component and they'll test it over the entire spectrum of whatever that characteristic is um, for that component. So they know exactly where and when that component will fail. In the U.S., we just test based on what the customer says they want it to pass. We don't test the whole thing. Um, but this idea of trade-off curves, we were able to actually also apply to sales. So if you have a sales team that's that's doing estimating, for instance, and they're overwhelmed with estimating work. You can go back and study all the things, the, the things that they've lost, the proposals that they've lost, and start to look for patterns or things that are in common. And then you can do a trade-off curve. And on the right side are the things that I don't want to bid those. You know, I always lose them. You know, eventually, if I have the people and the time, we could go after those. But for right now, I need to work on the things on this side of the curve, the things I know we can win. And that freed up like 50, 60 percent of their time, the estimator's time, by not having to work on things that you're potentially going to lose. I, I've done this in other businesses as well. So it's it's there are a lot of even scrum. The first time that I that I learned scrum. The first thing we did was we looked at how we could apply it in business and we immediately started working with. R&D and engineers and using the, the Kanban boards uh, in order to make all their work visible. And then it's really funny because when you first set the board up, the end process has about 10 stickies in it where they're all working on the, trying to work on the same things at the same time, kind of like the yeah. board you put up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and then, you know, with that is comes, comes the waste. I forget the, the name of the curve that Nigel shows. Um, but, you know, if you're doing two things at once, 20% is waste. You know, it's uh, the example is texting and driving, right? That none of us do that, but, um, <laughs> you know, that 
if you're if you're texting and driving, either 20 percent of the time your eyes aren't on your phone or they're not on the road. Um, so uh, so that's that's what the example is talking about is literally when you're trying to work on two things at exactly the same time. So we, mm. we teach that to companies, you know. So uh, but the lean sales is, is fascinating. And, and we were able to apply all the lean principles to sales. And it's it's uh, uh, made a big difference for them. You've had your you know, when when, when Ponch introduced you to Boyd and Uda, um and, and as you've explored it deeper, do you have any anecdotes of story, you know, where really where you brought somebody to an awakening and or awareness of Boyd, which completely blew the doors off their thinking too? Or? Oh, whenever I bring it up in lean training class um, and we start talking about it there, it, there are always some people that just the light bulb goes off and they, they want more information right away. So it's, 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 it, it, it is fascinating and people do 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 want to know more because I, I don't have time to get into all the OODA loop with them. I mainly talk about that implicit guidance and control path versus PDCA yeah. and then the relationships with the feedback. But it's the same with Kinevin. I introduced Kinevin in all the classes too. Mm. But there's not time to go through it in, in much depth just to make them know it exists. You know, just when it clicks, it's so amazing to see when it when it clicks and people they they just get it and then and they, you know their their ability to compete and collaborate and cooperate and create it just it, it skyrockets and 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 they don't even um, like why didn't I think of this before <laughs> you know or, or or I'm doing it now I have an awareness of how it's actually functioning and now I can get better at it. Yeah, and the, the more you learn about it, the more the more you just keep learning, the, the more you just keep finding, you just keep finding connections out there uh, yeah, I mean, with we, these we, type things. Yeah. We've said it on the episodes before. I mean, 1995 at Marquette university in the Naval ROTC program, they taught us the Boyd cycle. And it, and ever since then, it's just, um, it's just a deeper exploration all the time. It's amazing. And he was yeah, still the alive then. <laughs> the, so the OODA loop was profiled in that book by um, competing against time, which was one of the books that he had there. Yeah. And he had um, comments on that. Yeah. Yeah. He, so the, the authors, um, now I forget. Oh yeah. I've got it. Or something. Uh, anyway, the, it's, not, the, it's two on the authors, PDF uh, that you sent. Yeah. Um, Stout, Tom Stout, and, and uh, I forget their names. Yeah, but, um, yeah Stalk and Hout. That's it, Stalk and Hout. Stalk and so, Hout. So uh, they actually talk about the OODA loop in the book, which I think is is really interesting. Back then, though, it's it's not the OODA loop picture that we see today. It's just the, the circular one. Um, but that's that showed the immediate linkage between lean thinking um and the OODA loop. And, and that book was actually profiled in a Tom Peters video back then called uh, Speed is Life. <clears throat> and he, he talked about that, that book a lot. Time-based competitors are offering greater varieties of products and services at lower cost and in less time than their more pedestrian competitors. In doing so, they are literally running circles around their slower competition. And, and that book even got into the notion of fast transients um so uh did, i don't did know you if they mentioned the word what, yeah that we just had for in, in in uh right ahead of the super bowl we put up a video of uh major general uh brooke leonard from uh he's an f-16 pilot and f-35 pilot and he gave a description of fast transients in their discussion was you know if, if you're coaching a game this sunday you might want to pay attention to this <laughs> to the oh yeah for sure <laughs> <laughs> you definitely want to get in the other guy's OODA loop for the super bowl <laughs> yeah i mean i think that that's where a lot of people come into OODA loop you know they understand you know how we were taught it back in you know rotc you know you get inside somebody's time cycle or you know you compress time but then as the more you get into it and you explore and expand on it you realize that that's a very narrow piece of the scope of this guy's work around complexity sciences and, and what was coming. And when, when we had Dave Snowden on, it was fascinating to hear him say, um, 
it would have been interesting to see had John lived a little longer than than age uh, 70, 72, I think he was when he passed. If he had just lived a little longer to see how what we know is due to loop through the final sketch that he made before he passed, you know, what would it have evolved to like, what, cause, cause he was not one to set things in stone and he hated writing things down and he was always was changing. It would be really interesting to see. Um, and that's where we're picking up, trying to pick up the work and as best we understand it. Yeah. We've been, we've been trying to evolve that as well. I know Poncha has too. Um, mm. and we, we did that in the Quantico training as well. We were, we were looking into some of that, but it'd be interesting to have another one of those. Cause I think we've all learned so much since then we'd have some really even more interesting discussions around it. Cause we definitely have some new thoughts on, especially the orientation block. Um, may, may I ask you a and, biographical question that ties into this? Sure. Um, like, like I, I'm a product of Jesuit schools too. And I know that you went to Loyola, um, and, their system of total formation, their system of uh, creating a broader, broader worldview. I'd be curious to your perspectives on perspectives on that because I've always felt that how they taught us to think matched well with what I've learned and in, in, in been exploring with on board. You know, the total formation of the person to engage the the world and in, in, uh, in a wide variety of things. So, so t- I totally agree. So my uh, most of my college experience, at, well, all my college experience at Loyola was night school. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, I was really fortunate to have to go to night school because there people really want to learn. Mm-hmm. And you have people in the class that already have a bunch of really varied experience that are now contributing to conversations that you don't necessarily get back when I was, you know, in, in college during the days. Um, but I'd say there's a big contrast to Loyola and, and the other uh, colleges that I went to from that from that regard, because it's it's mm-hmm. more about it's developing the whole person and, right. and really teaching you to think. And I had a teacher, um, uh, Richard Frankie, um, who was like one of the best teachers I, I ever came across, who actually started teaching us how to apply um statistics to business and how to look at correlations when and to be critical of everything literally everything that you read similar to to boyd um and his policy on grades was that basically it wasn't it wasn't based on tests like he didn't give tests he just gave you a grade at the end of the class and it drove people nuts because the people that want to get the straight A's couldn't handle that. <laughs> they didn't mm. know how to handle it. Um, but to him, it, it, it's, it goes back to the KPI discussions, right? To him, he didn't want people to focus on the grade. He wanted people to focus on the learning. The learning, um, yeah. And, and, coming up and, and coming up with their own ideas and not have the pressure of the grade you know, driving you toward what you thought he wanted you to come up with. So it was it was kind of interesting from that perspective. It, it's it's funny how that system works and really correlates to everything we're talking about. Um, because I might drives my wife nuts when I do this. I can literally name every single professor in every subject in every class because regardless if you're learning physics or history or literature or whatever, they all took that approach of of learning and, and inquiry to the point where again it becomes unforgettable. Um, and then you're drawn to things like Kaizen and Toyota production and, and, and Boyd, because you're constantly trying to get better. I mean, that was another thing that I took from uh, my Jesuit education is that you're not finished. You have to keep, you have to keep going and improving. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. Yeah. So Charlie, we've taken up uh, quite a bit of your time uh, today. Uh, I just want to make sure our listeners know where to find you. Uh, what's the best way to contact you? And uh, if you're coaching and training folks on the OODA loop and lean, I think your clients are going to be able to kick butt and take names later. So um, how do they get in touch with you? So uh, our website is uh, biglean.com, And that's 
uh, probably the best way to get in touch with us. I, I can give you my email or phone information if you want later. Um, okay. But that's probably the best way to get to get a hold of us. All right. And then business uh, this year coming out of COVID, uh, walk us through what's happening in, in, in the world. What, what are you seeing? Um, the, there's an interesting thing going on in the U S right now that I've never, and it's not just the U S, uh, probably, you know, worldwide, I, I, at least in the European countries where all of a sudden there's this drastic shortage of labor, hmm. um, and qualified labor. And that in conjunction with the fact that all the baby boomers are retiring, Mm. So companies that haven't done standard work that don't have the policy and procedures and muscle memory um, are now finding themselves faced in situations where people are leaving and they're losing the recipe. Mm. And there are a lot of companies now looking to bring back people that have retired to train and coach the people that are there because there, there's no one else to do it. Um, what are, so what a, are the gaps? Like, hard. What are the what are the big deficiency gaps that they're bringing? They're bringing these people back to, to coach and teach. Uh, it's in a lot of areas. It can be technical knowledge. It can be, um, you know, machinists running machines, mm. um, people to assemble. Um, it, it's it's all over. I've never seen anything like it. So there's this, uh, we're in an era all of a sudden where you just can't find people or you can't find qualified people that you need to do things. Hmm. And, um, and it's a real struggle. It's a real struggle for companies now, you know, to, to how do you deal with that? So you're in a situation where you have to be do more with less. And I think it's also going to drive, it's going to start to really drive automation because mm. if I can't get the workers, I got to have robots, um, you know, to to replace them. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see see what happens as we keep going down that down that path to see where it leads. Because it's a very you, you, the, the other issue is the supply chain shortages. Mm. Um, we've had supply chain shortages within you know, electronics or within specific areas in the past. Um, I can remember when, you know, Motorola would put us on allocation for chips and those kind of things. Mm. But now it's like worldwide, like you just can't get stuff. And most companies have a huge backlog. They still have a backlog, but they can't get the products out because they don't have the people or they don't have the knowledge. Um so uh, I, I actually know an example of a company where, you know, you hate to say this, but literally the guy got hit by a bus and died and they couldn't build the product anymore. They had to discontinue it. Wow. A total single point of failure. Huh? Yeah. Nobody, nobody else knew how to nobody do it. Do it. Um, so between the labor shortage and the supply chain shortage, it, it's created a very challenging environment for CEOs today. Uh, and uh, I don't, I don't necessarily see light at the end of the tunnel right away. Mm. So I don't, I don't know yeah. where it's going to go. I, I was, you know, I think the the supply chain shortage is easing a little bit, and and it's strange that you know we're on the heels of a of a possible recession when companies have backlogs of stuff that they can't deliver. Mm. Okay. So how do, you'd have to tell me, Mark, how that ties into yeah. economics class, but. It's a kind of a strange situation. Yeah, you certainly hear. Yeah, you hear all kinds from depending on 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 the economist. Most predictions, uh, as you know, are usually wrong. Um, but the the principles that you're talking about, you know, you, where there's yeah you know, between that and there's also too a lot of where the where the source of these manufacturing is there's there's tremendous demographic crises looming, um, which we hear. Um, and you know, a lot of things people say, well, we're going to go local again, or we're going to, things are going to break apart. They're too big, but you know, it's too hard to, uh, 
predict. I guess in the anticipatory nature of UDA, you can certainly see those things. And I guess the one thing that does come to my mind that we've talked about with other guests is is artificial intelligence is going to become more uh, more pervasive and, and and take a bigger place in uh, in the world. I guess I don't know. What do you think about artificial intelligence in that respect? I think we have to be really careful with it. <laughs> Yeah. Cause I know my phone already does things that I, you know, all of a sudden Siri will just show up. <laughs> oh yeah. So, so they're so always Charlie, listening. Given the, yeah. Given the context that we talked about with the, you know, w- with what you just pointed out, what you're seeing, um, how could leaders benefit? Or what, are, what are the key points that leaders can pull from not just the Toyota production system and lean, uh, but the OODA loop, what, what are the key messages that leaders can pull from them and, and apply to today's environment? I, I, again, just thinking out loud, I, I, I would say the first thing is situational awareness. Right. Is even knowing you're in the situation. So, uh, uh, you know, at a lot of companies, you, you go in and you assess where they are and they they have no idea where they are, or how bad it is. <laughs> Well, um, they don't even know they have a customer. They couldn't tell you their customer. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't. I mean, it depends at what level you're at. It, certainly on the shop yeah. floor level. Yes, I've seen that. Yeah. You know. Well, well in, in, in the world I'm coaching in right and, now, it's very uh, every day. It's the same question. Who's your customer? Mm. We don't know. <laughs> Charlie, yeah, Charlie, do I you mean, think that uh, uh, I was going to just comp- you, you, I just wanted to ask you. When you bring up situational awareness, do you think that's due in part to a lack of self awareness in for leaders and teams that leads to a lack uh, of situational you, awareness? I, I would say yes. I was actually I was I was I was figuring that was kind of where you were going, and um, I, I would say yeah, there's definitely a lack of self awareness, and uh, there are things I want to say but I can't really say. The, the, <laughs> that's fine <laughs> but i i can say there's a family are, show <laughs> there, are, there are people that i have asked them to kind of grade themselves on on certain you know uh, characteristics leadership characteristics or their knowledge or whatever and they grade themselves you know as fours and fives with five being the top um you know that that in their minds they're like perfect or close to perfect so they they don't they don't have the self awareness to know, hmm. you know what they don't know. And I think, you know, there's there's kind of three sayings we have. Two of them come from a good friend of mine, Danilo Bruno Franco, um, who I worked with in China, and um, one of his sayings was, "Do you know what you don't know?" Hmm. The other one is, "Do you know how to check?" And the third one is, are you managing the problem or are you fixing the problem? Hmm. And I carry those three things with me to every company that I go to. So say and, those again. So do you know what you don't know? How, how do you check? Do you, do you know how to check? Do you know how to check? Because you'd be surprised. Most people don't know how to check. And the people that are checking don't even really know what they're checking or how they're checking. And I can give you lots of examples of that. And then the other one is, are you managing the problem or fixing the problem? And mm-hmm. that gets into your drive through parking at McDonald's, which is a, a book I'm working on. But um, the, 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 when, when all your baby boomers are retiring, what ends up happening is you don't know what you don't know. You bring somebody new in to a situation that somebody has been managing for 30 years and then they take over and then first thing they want to do is start changing everything, but they don't even know what they don't know. And the next thing you know, they're just creating a mess. Um, so that self-awareness to me is really important. Do you know what you don't know um, is, is a big piece of this. It, it comes up all the time and we've brought, I've, I bring it up a lot. and I've certainly said it on these episodes. It's not, it's that quote from either Twain or Will Rogers, but it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you're absolutely certain of that turns out not to be true. Mm-hmm. It's funny. One of the things my grandfather always told me was in Japan, the workers and management and government 
work together. You know, it was mm. Japan Incorporated. In the U.S., they all fight each other. Yeah. I'd, I'd go back in a heartbeat. I, I absolutely love living there. It was it was uh, an experience that just is, if, if you haven't gone, if people haven't gone, they should go and just see how it operates on a completely different rhythm. Um, mm-hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah, just the bullet train. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, just set your watch by it. I don't know about talking about complexity. I mean, when you're walking down Tokyo and these back alleys and there's just thousands and thousands of businesses and bars and restaurants that are so tiny and still, still moving. And it's almost like you never can run out of things to do in Tokyo or places to see. Mm -hmm. So complex. All right, Charlie. Hey, we've taken up a lot of your time. We're going to keep you on here for a minute. The, we should have an episode on the bullet train in California and how awful that thing is going. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's an insane problem right there. Um, speaking of government and businesses fighting each other, uh, that's and all the lean problems with that. That that's an amazing story. Uh, but thank you for your time today, Charlie Protzman, uh, Shingo Prize winner. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, friends, Charlie. Friend of the show. Uh, any parting shots from you or thoughts? No, it's just been an honor and a privilege to be on your on your podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's it's been really special and just even just trying to prepare for this has actually forced me into, you know, quite a bit of learning as well. Just putting, putting all this together, um, going, going back through the archives and refreshing myself on all that. It's, it's been an interesting learning journey. So, uh, I really appreciate it. Well, we're we're honored to be on it with you. And that's the, uh, that's the intent is a, a learning conversation. You've certainly provided that. So we're very grateful, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you.